naopak. <coughs> okay, so the aim of, of the, these few slides, and there really are just a few slides, is to introduce the main ideas of um, computer vision. Um, and, and not all of computer vision at that, but just some of computer vision. And the part that I'm going to be talking about is classification and detection. I did a little experiment with myself today. I, I, I've been very, very busy lately. Haven't had any fun whatsoever. Uh, but I had about four hours today that I set aside to prep for today's meeting, which is a lot of time. I usually don't use that much time to prep for it, so it was a real luxury. And I thought that I would use um, chat GPT to make my slides entirely. And I, I wasn't successful and I, I kind of got sidetracked and then I'm like, oh, my fun time is gone and I really need to finish this stuff. <laughs> but uh, th this is an image that the chat GPT made to represent um, the, the tools that I'm talking about today and specifically their um, kinds of computer models that take an image or take video and uh, do um, functions called classification and detection. And the way that these are usually represented in pictures is uh, you have a picture of something interesting and there's a bounding box around that and the box is around um, something that specific that's been identified in the picture and it also has a spatial orientation within the frame that um, that shows the location of that object in the image. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of theory with this. The point of this was to be accessible to people to give them ideas for their own research and to, and to show how easy the tools can be. Uh, now, I say it's easy. We probably will run into some snags and you'll watch me problem solve with the snags in real time. I haven't attempted to run the notebook on my little laptop. It was running perfectly earlier, so we'll see how we do. So these slides were also um, with prompts from myself. The slides and all of the content, the Quarto code and everything was ChatGPT. I'll show you a few that, that were not ChatGPT when we come to them. So um, <clears throat> classification and detection, a, a definition uh, that's very, very terse is to um, assign a label and it could be to a uh, to an entire image um, frame to frame or it could be just a subset of that image, like I said, to localize it within a box. Usually we're talking about digital photographs here or it can be video, which is comprised of a lot of little photographs and frames. And the purpose is categorization. It's to automatically categorize something that uh, if you had a, th you know, if you had 10 pictures, like in uh, Are You a Human tests, uh, which, you know, humans sometimes fail. You might be surprised to uh, pick out all the bicycles in these images. Uh, humans have about a, a 90 to 95 percent success rate at picking all the bicycles, picking all the buses, picking all the boats. Um, but what if you had a thousand of them or 10,000 or a million pictures or a million frames of, um, you know, an hour of video or something like that? That's when these tools really come into their full power. Um, now, the process involved with this is to, uh, we have to train the algorithms to build the model based on a data set of, of uh, images that, that have been manually, uh, at least uh, I'm going back to the dark, darkest, dark ages of computer vision when we manually uh, labeled all of our own data. And now there are actually automation methods for uh, for automatically creating training data sets, but but in general it involves uh, creating a training data set by some method. And um, this is the techniques thing is uh, there is really a jungle of techniques now and this is this computer vision methods. Uh, if I say that as a catch-all term for loads and loads of kinds of models. Um, th this is an active area of research along with um, along with generative AI large language models and a few related techniques. Um, if we if we classify the two big ones, computer vision is one of the big ones and large language models is the other big one right now where there's a, 
a huge proliferation of um, new basic research, creating the techniques and applied research, finding solutions uh, and problems and putting them together. Okay, and one of the methods is uh, convolutional neural networks. And I'm not gonna go into any of the technical details of that today, but that's the method that is probably the most popular for computer vision. And it's the method that underlies uh, the framework we're gonna use today called YOLO. And I, I just wanted to show a picture of, I think that this is an AI gem generated image of a picture that is just an example of uh, of the kinds of images used to classify. And cats, indeed, cats and kittens are the very first published um, data set of um, three dimensional red, green, and blue computer images uh, as part of the one of the predecessors to the COCO data set, which we're going to be using today. OK, so YOLO, what is YOLO? Now you probably are, if you're a parent like me, uh, you're probably familiar with this term from social media. It, as far as I know, was popularized on The Simpsons and in the film Mastermind, uh, Megamind. Uh, you only live once, but here it's you only look once. And it's a, it's a bit of a um, pun about um, a class of convolutional neural network um, computer vision models that um, that pass over one image many, many times to come up with the final prediction. And in YOLO, as the name um, implies, you only look once, only has uh, one pass to come up with the, uh, the prediction. And uh, there is a trade-off in accuracy for these models. They're, they're not as accurate as the best competing computer models, but the trade-off is with speed. And these kinds of models are much, much, much faster than uh, the traditional models. And and now, with the current version of YOLO, they are um, they're they're so uh, good that they're almost as good as the slow models, but so much faster. So real time video editing for um, for video, even high frame speed video, is possible with these models at, at high accuracy. <clears throat> Now there's been an evolution of these models and there are many different versions. Now what is on my next slide? I show, before I go on to this slide and talk through those um, graphs, I wanted to say something about the evolution of these models is that uh, the YOLO model was invented by a young man called Joe Redman. And uh, the original YOLO model um, has been cited about 41,000 times. Okay, it was published in 2016. And for scientists, for, for us in this room, 41,000 citations, that's, that's far more than 99% of any colleague you will ever have. Uh, I'm not just talking about Harvard, uh, here at Harper, I assure you, I'm talking about any, the best universities in the world. You typically would not achieve that many citations in your lifetime of research. Um, so that's an astonishing feat for a 20 year old young man doing his PhD. OK, it's a very important paper <laughs> amongst other important papers. And hopefully it will be forgotten. And it, well, I don't think it will be. It's yeah. continuing to be cited. Uh, yeah. And it, uh, one of the ways that it's not forgotten is that um, YOLO version one has continued to be built upon. And uh, that's what these graphs show. So this one was uh, the most recent version that I'm aware of is YOLO V8. There are many interim versions and it's open source. So there has been mutations, but the mainstream branch of evolution is the YOLO versions. And um, this compares the performance of uh, YOLO V5 through the current one, YOLO V8. And uh, this graph shows how big um, the models are in terms of the parameters. Now, that I think this is probably for the largest um, version of these models because each each one of the generations itself has very small, medium, and very large versions of of itself. But uh, what you can see is that in general, the um, subsequent generations have gotten 
uh, a little bit smaller. And uh, on this axis, this um, MAP, this COCO MAP, the um, MAP is a um, acronym that stands for Mean Average Precision. And it's a measure of how good uh, the models perform, how well they perform quantitatively uh, by placing boxes around uh, known locations of objects and images. And uh, this is the COCO part of this is a um, is a benchmarking data set of uh, I think it's got a hundred different image classes, and we'll have a peek at some of those classes when we get to the code. So you can see that the latest version and the, the each of these nodes is the nano, the small, the medium, the large, and the extra large version of yellow V8. There, it's not only the smallest of all the YOLO models in the main evolution, but it's also the highest precision for all of the size of these models. So both of those are fantastic progress. This one over here is a measure of the speed. Um, it's a um, on a particular GPU, the A100. Uh, um, this is a measure of the, the speed with which uh, image predictions are generated for individual pictures. And again, you can see that the, um, the latest version is, is both faster and more accurate than all of the predecessors. And we don't even have um, versions on this of, the, of bigger alternative convolutional neural networks. They wouldn't even be on the same scale here Yellow is so much faster, but they, they would tend to be a little more accurate. OK. <clears throat> now, um, I'm actually not going to talk about the architecture at all. What is meant by architecture? Um, for some reason, this figure should have been on its own slide. Damn AI. Now I can just uh, blame it for uh, messing up these slides. I did look at them before, but there it is. Well, I'm not going to take the time away from what I want to accomplish here to um, to go over anything about the architecture, but there's a little picture of a pyramid here. And um, what the pyramid cartoon represents with respect to the architecture is that um, a, a powerful metaphor is that each one of those layers of the um, pyramid in that diagram is uh, is like a torch shining on an image and the torch uh, shines light on um, individual pixels that uh, that are used to make statistical associations with whatever prediction the training data set has for that image and uh, the idea is that the um, the pyramid gets smaller towards the top and so does the uh, area of the torch shining on the image as different so-called layers of the statistical model go and what's happening in those is that the smallest layers are picking out features like um, pixels that are together in a straight line or pixels that are maybe curved and the slightly bigger torch might be picking, picking out features that are like an eye for an animal or a, a hand uh, and so forth um, uh, until we have this architecture. That's what the architecture refers to. Um, I've already mentioned the highlight. Uh, the highlights of the advantages of using YOLO, it's that it's really small and fast. It's it's one of the only shows in town for um, for uh, edge computing for video. There are some alternative models, but uh, YOLO is both better and um, and much faster compared to say TensorFlow Lite. OK, so if we go down again, some applications, um, well, YOLO is already implemented in quite a lot of a lot of fields, and there's an academic literature on uh, demonstrating this. The demonstration literature tends to be um, a bit old now uh, because the model's been around for uh, quite a long time. 2016 is like forever in uh, computer vision years. Um, there are loads of application papers in agriculture for YOLO and similar models. And uh, yeah, I thought I'd highlight just just one example very briefly. This is a uh, a trap. We have one of these um, 
I should bring it in. Uh, Matt, you've got to remind me to bring this sucker in because it's just sitting in my garage. But we, we purchased this to test as a commercial uh, product with a PhD project. And what they purported that this product would do, what happens is um, this little chimney up here is a um, pheromone uh, chimney. You put in a little bit of chemical pheromone for whatever pest you're trying to attract in. Um, the animal enters the trap and goes into the chamber and it falls on a sticky surface. And every so often, the um, there's a camera that takes a picture and by SMS beams the data um, to the satellite, to the cloud, and then some um, some computer vision predictions are made. And then every so often, every day or so, so often, we never did quite figure out exactly what was happening inside of it, even though we, we looked in it a lot. Um, the roller of sticky tape turns by itself. Now, what you get out of this, what we found with this particular technology, this was about three years ago uh, with Peter Nagimwa, and we were, um, he was working on fall armyworm, an African, well, it's actually an international pest of maize and other other animals, but we tested it on um, another lepidopteran here that was on its list of ones that uh, it would detect. And um, we found that it didn't work very well, basically. And what we thought was happening with this particular product was they said, right, we've got the hardware here and the, um, the training data set, we will allow our customers to collect for us. And over time, our models will get good and work. What we found for the, uh, what, what is the, do you remember, Matt, what the pest was we were using? It was the apple. It was, in, it was at, at apple orchards, wasn't it? Yes, it was the, what is what is the name of it? Can you remember? Oh, I can't I remember. That. It was in apple orchards, though, a little, a little moth with a dark brown waist band. Anyway, we found it didn't work very well. We weren't very impressed at all with it. Um, the thing that was nice about it was that it was, it had a solar panel that charged its own battery, and it uh, uh, the only user uh, maintenance was replacing that um, that roller of sticky tape, and that all seemed to work pretty well. It was just the uh, the data part that didn't work very well. Okay, so now I've got a code along part. Now, the, coddling. the coddling moth that's what it was yeah that's exactly right i have some apple trees at my house and i had some there so i took the trap home intending to set it up but never did now if you want to do this uh and code along i think that's possible okay um you will need a few requirements and maybe you want to try this later and just pay attention to what i'm doing one of the things i want to demonstrate to you is how little code you actually need, not only to play with this, this yellow eight V8 framework, but literally you need almost no code to train your own model. Uh, now building up a pipeline of something to do something useful would be a little more ambitious, but I just wanna show how easy it can be. So hopefully it will look very easy. So the way that uh, I've set this up is I've got, um, an HTML of the run notebook, but but if you're going to run along with me, don't click on that one. Copy, right click this one and copy the link to the uh, repo. I'm just going to open that link to show it to you. Okay, it looks like this, and this all this is is a is an IPython notebook. Uh, the reason we copied that link was uh, that um, now to code along, you will need a, a Google account. So um, I should be uh, logged straight in. I'm just going to cancel this real quick. Whenever you log into to Colab for the first time, um, it loads up this um, for the first time for a given session. That is, it loads this up and uh, you'll have to log in with a Google account, like I say, to access this. But what you would want to do is go to the file and go open an existing notebook because we're just going to open mine. And you'd want to go down to GitHub. And then you'd want to paste in that URL that you copied. Um, 
Now, for any GitHub repo that has any notebook you ever want to open, this is the uh, no code method, and it just highlights that one that we're going to open. So if we just click on that. Um, another thing I want to do right away is I want to go up to um, <clears throat> edit and clear all the outputs. And I, if you're following along, if you'll do the same, we can run this together. Now I've made a, um, a note to myself. By God, I, I kept forgetting when I was running this notebook and testing it a little bit to uh, make my runtime with a graphics processing unit. And if you haven't used this stuff before, what's going on here is that Google Colab is a um, is a web-based um, space that, that Google shares with the world uh, for free. Now, what what is the space? The space is a, a place for you to write computer code. You can write R code, use it in there. But the real neat thing about it is not that it allow, allows you to edit code. It's that it um, gives you a free instance of a computer that you control uh, in the cloud. And um, by default, you come to, to Mr. Google and you say, all right, in Colab, can I please have a little piece of your computer? And Google says, no problem, here's a piece of the computer. But it gives you the, the, a CPU, a central processing unit with RAM um, and some computing tools already loaded up for you. But um, what, what we want here for graphics processing, almost all of the algorithms are op optimized not to run on CPUs, but on graphics processing units or tensor processing units, GPUs and TPUs. And so uh, the way we do that is uh, first we have to, um, now I see that I could just click here and connect to a T4, <coughs> something called a T4. And I know that a T4 is a um, kind of GPU, but if it's the first time you've done this, you would want to um, <clears throat> change the runtime type. Um, you can pick Python 3 or R here. We're going to stick with Python. And you can pick which one you want. And the one that I do want is just the plain old GPU. TPU is a tensor processing unit. This is, this is hardware tied to open source AI stuff that, that's specific to Google. But the most mainstream one is a graphics processing unit um, based on NVIDIA graphics processing unit chips. You don't need to know any of that to run this, except that you need the GPU option. <coughs> so I'm going to save that. I'm going to click Connect. Uh, a couple of buttons over here if you're new to this stuff. I've got a table, of there, but there's not much um, detail on it. We don't, we don't need much detail in this one. There are only two acts. First one is we're going to make predictions using one of the YOLO foundation models, one of the defaults. And we're going to make a prediction on a new novel photograph. And if we have a little bit of time, if I can stop rambling on, then uh, if you're coding along, you can you, you can play with this by uploading your own photographs. So um, the first thing we need to do is um, we these days in the newest version, the way that you run YOLO is that uh, actually I mentioned Joseph Redman, Joe Redman, who became like a data science rock star when he was just doing his PhD. He, he went on and he graduated and he started collaborating with uh, some other people. The world wanted to collaborate with him. And he chose to, um, to leave the field of computer vision AI, which is a little surprising to me because he made such a big splash. But uh, some of his co early collaborators carried on with uh, the yellow main evolution and uh, they formed this company called Ultralytics. And I think that they provide solutions for video and a lot of their examples are in the sports world. And I've, I've heard that some VR tools uh, in sports and the, the things we hear about sports commentating with AI, I think that this company is involved in it. But they have maintained the nice open source nature of it. And they've got this nice new tool that is easier to use than ever with um, Ultralytics. For those of you who are paying attention, um, we have to have the exclamation point here for PIP 
for this um, because it's a, it's a terminal command. And we also want to just go ahead and install Open Computer Vision, OpenCV Python. We're going to go ahead and import CV2, one of the um, toolboxes for just displaying images, which we'll use a little bit later, and ipython.display, um, some of their functions uh, from um, that we'll use also to display images. So this should just work, three, two, one. Going to run it anyway. This is not much code. You can look at this. It's um, safe as milk, I assure you. <clears throat> so that'll quit running in just a second. Give it a moment. Still watching it run. There it goes. I'm just going to collapse that. And then um, now, uh, the next thing we need to do is if you go over to this right hand side, there's a little key of tabs over here. One, one of them is a key. We'll come back to that. One of them is a folder. And uh, this is your memory that you've been alloc allocated in Google Colab. If you go back, to the um, <clears throat> to the um, the schedule web page, there's there's a link to a photo that says Ed Owl Pick, and uh, it's a picture of me with an owl on my hand, and uh, you can download that. And uh, if you have it handy, um, what you can do, um, I'll show it to you. It it looks like that. OK, this is from like a bird sanctuary in Shropshire. Um, so what you will want to do with this is um, you'll just want to drag it over into your into your uh, folder here. This this picture is safe as milk. It's downloading. You can see the progress over here. I'm on the Wi-Fi, so it's a little slow when that when that finishes uploading, this is quite a big pick. It's just from my my um, camera phone. So uh, there it is. It's popped in. And um, now you've seen what's in the picture. And let me explain what these next two blocks are. There are different ways that you can implement YOLO here. If I just make this a bit bigger for people who are watching. Um, one way is the command line way. It's command line. So we need the exclamation point. So we're calling YOLO. Uh, we remember we haven't done anything but install it um, so far. So we're we're calling YOLO. We're um, telling it that we want to give it a task, and that task is uh, detection. And then we're separating our next command with a backslash. We're telling it a mode that we uh, want to put it in, and we want to make a prediction. Now, the fact that we're putting it into the prediction mode means that um, we want to um, we want to uh, give it an image and we want to make a prediction. We haven't trained any models, so we're basing that prediction just on the default model. And the default model is that Coco model that I mentioned um, that's got like 100 different categories of all sorts of things like people and different kinds of animals, stuff like that, vehicles. Now, the model that we're picking is the nano model. It's yellow v8n.pt. Now, this, this is a file that we'll download here in a second. Uh, it will automatically download this for us. And what it is, is um, remember that graph that I showed that had all the parameters, right? Like millions of parameters. And th th these are equivalent to millions of um, tiny little regression coefficients. And what this file is, is it contains the existing weights, they call them, it's a weights file of all of those statistical parameters. Um, we can set a baseline confidence for making a prediction. So um, we'll classify something if the prediction is greater than 25% probability. And that's relative to all of the other things in the model. So if you have a model with um, 100 different things and the things are all quite similar, um, setting this conf confidence um, level might be different than if you had a, one with just two things. If you had just two things, 
you'd want that confidence to be more than 50 percent wouldn't you mm -hmm. so that, there's a little bit of logic involved in that and then the source is just a picture which we've just uploaded let's just run this and see what comes out of it first three two one we're going to get some output nothing fancy to look at um, what it's doing is it's downloading now the weights and it just popped it up over here next to us um, now that file is 6.23 megabytes it's um, it's downloading the um, rest of the framework for the for the model and uh, if I just if I just make it um, oh I don't need to move it it's read in the image one of one it's read it from the default directory it has scaled it to 640 by 480 which is the default for yellow v8 and it has classified one person and one bird and to do that it took 76 thousandths of a second that's pretty slow for just one picture but remember it was a big picture and it had to scale it first and everything so uh, it did, did do it um, pretty quick now that's one way to do it uh, we'll have a look at the prediction it made in just a second we'll visualize it <clears throat> um, now there's another way to run this which is the way that i prefer um, this is probably the way to run it is the function way and from this one you know to do it from scratch had we not already run that um, from this uh, we've already installed ultralytics and we'll import the yellow function and uh, we can set up our model by setting it to the model weights contained in that model version that we want remember we can change that model version this will be the least accurate version of the model but it'll be the smallest version of the weights model and um, I'm just going to set two parameters they are the same as two of the parameters that we used up above and uh, let's see what that one does three two one Now this one, the output is a little bit different. <clears throat> um, this gives us um, a uh, an array of um, of uh, the the inputs for the the picture. Now it's um, I guess this this will probably be um, arrays for each of the layers of information. It's also given us. A, uh, an array of the things that might be in the picture compared to the, the foundation model that we use. So there might be a person, there might be a bicycle. So there's zero up to, um, so 80 um, in total, yeah. zero to 79. There might be a toothprint brush or an oven or a mouse. That, that's yeah. that's what the Coco data set, uh, Ed. That's, that's Say again? That's what the Coco data set is trained on. Yes, yes, exactly that. Yes, exactly that. Those are all the possible. Um, those are all the possible classes. Exactly right. Trained in the Coco data set. So with, with this, um, we would get an actual probability um, for for all of these for any identified objects. And they would be low for toothbrush and everything else that is not in the picture. OK, so this some of the details in the default outputs here are a little bit different, but what we really want to see is um, just wanted to show you how this works. Um, at some point when we ran the first model, a runs folder popped up and in that would be runs for the detection function that popped up and in that would be uh, detection runs that uh, did a prediction and then we got our image out. And um, we can just display that image in line like this. And it, it has predicted I'm a person with 88% uh, probability, and that's a bird I'm holding with 57% probability. Okay, so that's how this uh, works. Now, if there were time, I don't think there really is. Um, Time because I want to demonstrate the next part. It's a little more uh, advanced in a way, but I, I hope it just works. Um, just to show you how to train some custom data. But you know, a little bit later, if you try to run this 
um, <clears throat> what you can do is try weights from one of the different models. You can go to the analytics, um, ultra analytics web page, and you can see the names of um, their different models. Where are they on here? Here they are. So these are the models. The one we did was the nano model. That's the, um, got the lowest uh, MAP, but is the fastest and the smallest by far amount of parameters. But, you know, try some of these other models and see if you can get my probability as a person up higher. That would be nice. The other thing you can do is, of course, try your own pictures um, to, to uh, just, you know, have some fun with it. Let's go back for now. Okay, go ahead and render that again. There we go. Now the um, the name of the game here is that we want to um, do custom data. Now I knew uh, for just a really fast intro here, we wouldn't be able to get into the labeling of data because we, we typically would want at least hundreds of pictures of an example of each kind of object, but but usually it would be thousands for for each class. Um, I don't I don't know how many uh, examples of each of the classes were for the Coco data set. There are different versions of the Coco data set. It's a famous one. And the Coco 80 is is just one of them, but th there probably were a thousand or more examples or at least hundreds and hundreds of examples for each um, different class. It's a neat thing. Uh, I, I, I'm warming up to this, but I reacted negatively when I first discovered this. I think the first version of YOLO I really used with any serious intent was YOLO v5. <clears throat> what version did you use for your project, George? YOLO v5, but I have tampered with YOLO V8 as well, the pose estimation model. You've, you've tampered with it. I like that word. Um, I mean, YOLO... Is that because you're from Tampa? No, no. You, you tampered with it. I think I like it because it's probably accurate. That's how I code as well. <laughs> I tamper <laughs> with code. The, um, the, the RoboFlow is a company associated with Ultralytics. And uh, it didn't exist when we used Yellow V5 those years ago. Um, and when I discovered it, it seemed like um, what I describe as, you may have heard me use this metaphor before, it, it struck me as a creepy treehouse where um, these guys were saying, right, you're here to use Yellow V5, but look over here, look over here, there's RoboFlow. It's super nice. It, it, all you have to do is come inside. There's some really nice candy in here. Just come inside with us. You'd have to give your credentials. You have to give your email. You have to sign up. You can pay for some of their services. But I have actually warmed up to them. Because I did some work with another student, um, um, Andrew. Uh, who did his project with Yellow V8 last year, and uh, I have warmed up to RoboFlow quite a lot, and we'll just have a peek at it really quickly. <clears throat> what RoboFlow, the problem Robo, RoboFlow intends to, um, to solve is um, that it, it's fiddly for uh, new users to um, to begin labeling all these images, and uh, the and if you if you use yellow V8, and maybe for some reason yellow V9 comes out, um, and they have a slightly different format uh, for all the labeling. Um, if you're, I mean, for in one way, if you're an expert programmer or if you're a competent programmer, you probably could convert it yourself. But this is a one-stop shop. They do uh, if you if you train your images. They have web-based tools for you to draw the bounding boxes, and they have conversion tools to convert them out into any format, and they have a connection, including code generators. This is even before the days of AI. Uh, I don't know what they're up to these days, but um, they have code generators for boilerplate to, uh, to basically run your model and to use the data sets that they store on their website and just draw it into Colab or 
whatever cloud system you're using. And I have found that despite myself, it's sort of like the easy way. Sometimes I don't allow myself to consider the easy way all the time, but I, I do actually like it. It's pretty slick. And, and the fact that you can use it largely for free um, for, for uh, medium ambition stuff that is not commercial, I think is also pretty cool. So um, what you can do is you can um, look around for um, open projects and you can start your own projects and you can see that I have Matt's Weevil data set up here that I worked on with um, KK the student last year and in this project workspace I also have this um, one of their open they have about a thousand open pre-labeled data sets that you can just play with and I have chosen to give a demonstration of one of their open data sets this little um, this little thing is irritating me from Teams because I have to go out every time to get mm. back to my collab. There we go. All right, so uh, I mentioned this little key over here. Now, uh, this little key, see, one of the peculiarities of the cloud world these days is we all have single factor authentication, two factor authentication. Believe it or not, um, there is multi-factor authentication, and uh, they're considering using more than two-factor authentication here at Harper, if you can believe it. That would just be one straw too many for the camel's back, I think. But you have a single-factor authentication for RoboFlow. And uh, if you click that little key, uh, if you're using a, uh, if you want cloud services to talk to each other, you often have a, an individualized authentication key, an API key. And uh, what you can do is you can um, get your API key from your RoboFlow account. So you can set up your, your um, images here. The images I'm going to demonstrate today, I don't have a link um, handy for it. I'm not going to spend the time because we're going to run out of time here if I, if I allow myself to yammer on, um, is a data set of um, raccoon pictures. And it's a small data set of about three, hundred raccoon pictures and some of the pictures have background stuff in them and uh, some of them don't um, but what i've done is i've gone over there i've um, i've identified that set and i've exported that public data set in a version that's uh, yolo v8 format and um, i've got an api key i've entered it into my secret place here in colab now if you want to reproduce this code you are going to have to go to the Raccoon 38 data set on RoboFlow and get your own API key and uh, set it up in the secret place here. And once you do that, I've, I've named my alias from my secret API RoboFlow key, and it generates automatically a little bit of boilerplate code where you put your secret name uh, in there and, and it draws in your secret name. So now all of that fat, what it accomplishes for us, it allows us to uh, have some boilerplate code that anybody can use and you don't have to reveal your personal RoboFlow key. Okay, so I, that's my brief explanation of what that is. But other than that, um, <coughs> if you want to recreate this later, <clears throat> what we have to do is we have to install the RoboFlow framework and then we need to import the function RoboFlow and then we need to um, uh, if we're going to use that automatic API, we need to import the um, um, Colab user data package. Okay, so let's just do those first. That should just go without a hitch and um, let's let it finish. I think I'm going to get a warning here because uh, there's some dependencies there. Let's see if that's a warning or an error. So I'll go ahead and restart the runtime and see how much of this stuff that mucks up. It's restarting. OK. And then uh, what this does is it will, this line will bring in my API key. And uh, this line will um, pull in the workspace that I set up with the Raccoon data set. And that should just pop up 
here in our files if everything works. Okay, so let's do three, two, one. Of course not. Roboflow is not defined. <clears throat> so I may need to go up here and just run this again. I may need to run everything again. I'm not sure. Let's just run that again. Anybody who's coded um, knows how fiddly this stuff can be. So it does not have secret name RoboFlow key grant access. There we go. All seems to be working perfectly now. It's downloaded the data set. It should pop up over here. Let's give it a moment because it's, it's actually not that big, the data set. It's less than zipped. It's less than 10 megabytes. Let's just refresh. There it is. Okay, so now what I got from if you're setting up one of these data sets, the format for YOLO data, which I haven't explained in, on intentionally, is that uh, you have your picture, that's self-explanatory, but accompanying each picture, you have um, a file that has the coordinates of the box that goes around the objects and the class of that object for your training data set. The nice thing about RoboFlow is that it's exported all of the stuff we need it's given us a partition of the data set and train, test, and validate partitions. So, you know, like um, 70, 20, 10. And, uh, and this is the last part that I wanted to explain before we run the last model to train it on custom data. Is um, now th this, this process of training custom data on a foundation model has a jargon term. It's called, it's called, um, transfer learning. So we're, we're taking all of the features in the foundation model, we're adding a couple of, in this case, raccoon specific training features just on the end of the model. So we're not changing it very much at all and we're leveraging all the training that's happened before. But to tell it um, where the data is, we need to actually look in this, in this little um, YAML file. Everything happens in this YAML file. Now, um, the parts that we need to do is we need to tell the YAML file where the raccoon folder is in our file structure. So if I right click on raccoon, this is the non-code way to do this. We can just copy the path. Uh, you can't tell it by just looking at it, but what we would see if we looked in our present PWD, present working directory, is we'd see we're in the content folder, and in the content folder are all these folders. And so if we we just um, paste in <clears throat> content raccoon 38, paste, paste, and save, control S, and we don't have an asterisk up there, so that's saved. This little YAML file just sets up the, um, the, the workspace for where the training data is. That's all it does. And uh, there's even a link to the data set in there. So let's close that. Got our API key. And here's what's happening here. Use the command line way. We're doing a detection. Um, we're, we're training a new model. The foundation of that training is the um, small weights for YOLO. Our, our data are in content. Uh, raccoon 38 data.yaml. All the instructions are in there. We're just going to train it for 10 epochs. That's a very small amount. We would usually like default to 50 or 100 or something. We're going to keep that default image size. So let's see if this runs. Three, two, one. This will be the last thing we do because we're out of time. <clears throat> so it's downloading the new model. As I asked it for the small, not the nano. It's setting everything up. It prints out the architecture of different layers of the model. We don't have to worry about that for today. And in a second here, what we'll get is we'll get a 10 blocks of the training for each epoch. And we'll have a few minutes to kind of talk about what this stuff means. So epoch one of 10, it tells us how much GPU memory we're using 
for the free, it's running very quickly, you can see. Um, the thing we kind of want to look at is the uh, the loss or the maybe the mean average precision. This number should be going up. There's 0 0.807, 0 0.757, it's fluctuating. 0.807. Point nine two eight, epic seven coming. Point eight eight two. Point nine five five. Point nine five eight. Can we get better, or will it fluctuate down? Point nine three three. Okay, and that's it. So it, it's training quite quickly. Of course, this is a small data set. There are only about three hundred images total in the train test validate. Now you can, with code, make a diagnostic dashboard here, but one of the things that I also, I didn't love it when I first discovered it, but uh, it is convenient for our purposes today. So I'm going to show you um, the default outputs for the model. If you will go back to our runs folder, doing a detection task, and here we've got a new folder called train because we just trained a new model. So just using the default, one of the things I, I actually legitimately don't like about yellow V8 is that there are some hard coded um, uh, file paths in there. So if you're trying to, you either have to do it their way or you have to be uh, enough of a coder to dig into the open source code they give you to change that stuff. But it, both of those are possible even for, um, even for learners, let's say. But in this um, in this train folder, let's close it for a second, there's quite a lot of stuff you can see that pops out of there. Most of these are individual files. A thing I, thing I don't love about it is that it pops them out in a default way, a, a mindless way. Thing I, excuse me, thing I do like about it is that um, it gives you some diagnostic files but it also gives you um, it also gives you the raw data with which you can make your own diagnostic um, graphs and dashboard and whatever you want to do. So remember, we've just played around with this. Let's look at a training. Let's look at one of the latter training batches. And this is just a batch. You know, every every time that a, a cycle happens different subsets of pictures are uh, manipulated and picked. And so this is just an example of some of the training pictures. And what you can see is, um, you know, it's a shed load of raccoons. And uh, when there's not a raccoon in there, um, you know, we're not identifying a raccoon. When there is a raccoon in there, we've got a bounding box around the raccoon. So these are the training batches. Um, the zero on the training batch is the number of class uh, in the total number of classes. So since there's only one class captured here, uh, the numbering starts at zero, they're all zero. Um, and then if we just look at a validate, and this will be the last thing we look at, there are more results and I'd encourage you to look through them because it's fascinating um, and it is, it is quite slick what they've accomplished. So let's just look at one of the batches for predictions. And, um, it, you know, I ran a couple of these earlier with different settings on the nano model, and I can already tell that um, this model is is uh, quite a lot better because these predictions, even though we only trained for 10 epochs, are get, coming up with a 100%. Here's 100%, 100%, you know, 90%. There's some that are not as big. That's a very fat raccoon. Um, one of, it's got several bounding boxes redundantly around the same guy and one of them is 0.4 and one of them is something else I can't tell. This is identifying some bark on a tree at 0.3. So, you know, there. this isn't perfect. This is just a, a random sample of the predictions, but that is not bad for a very small training set and only 10 epics. We didn't even try to tune this sucker and it is already giving um, cool stuff. And the thing I want to end on, because we're out of time, is uh, that we know the predictions won't be perfect out of a model like this. We haven't even tried to make good predictions and we've used a tiny little data set and yet anybody could see that uh, these predictions, if you had a task like this, could be useful.
they could be something that could be powerful on a larger scale. And that really is the usefulness of YOLO. That is all I've got. I think we're out of time. The heat has been turned off. My hands are freezing in here. <laughs> Any questions or comments? <laughs> I couldn't see if anybody was um, still here or asking any questions because I have my slides up, but it's amazing. It's amazing. It is just amazing. Um, it is so slick, Matt. Um, I want to I want to do some some stuff with it and work with you on it. Let's do it. <laughs> it's so slick. Yeah. If you got the recording off. Now. Uh, let me turn the recording off. Are you going to say something really saucy? <laughs>